here. I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yep, you never saw it coming. And welcome, America, to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. It is so great to have you. We've got great guests again today. Diane Southard's going to be here, your DNA guide, talking about this strange thing called endogamy. What does that mean? Why could that affect your DNA results? She will explain that as well as some tips on dealing with mitochondrial DNA. So some good stuff coming up here in about 10 minutes. And then later in the show, Maureen Taylor, the photo detective is back talking about metadata that you can now put on your digitized photographs. How can we make that go with the photos when some of these sites, in fact, almost all sites, don't accept that metadata along with the photo you post? So we're going to get the full explanation as to where things are going with this effort that's going on nationwide right now to move along metadata with your photos as you post them. Hey, if you haven't checked out our brand new squeaky clean Extreme Genes website, you got to do that. Find out about the courses I'm offering right now for genetic genealogy and DNA and for basic genealogy. And of course, the full Extreme Genes archives now entirely searchable. So put in any keyword, it'll show you all the episodes that talk about that very thing. Right now, off to Boston, Massachusetts, where fresh back from his trip to Orlando, Florida, and those folks with the big ears, it's David Allen Lambert, right here. On our stage. On our stage. <laughs> How are you, kiddo? Hey, but you sound refreshed. Did you have a good time? I did. I did when we avoided the hurricane that came up the coast. We oh, yeah, got to yeah. fly out a little early. <laughs> that could put a little damper on your plans. Just a little bit. Hey, we got a lot of news here today with our family Histoire News. Let's start with this whole thing about Ancestry. They've picked up another major site, which is going to yes, be really useful to us. Yeah, they've added to their own family. Genianet is now part of it, which is a leading French genealogy company. It's a really big company. I met them at RootsTech a couple of years back, and they have records in 10 languages oh, in yeah. 25 countries. They use. It's great stuff. Yeah, c'est le signifié que vous pouvez rechercher vos ancestres français. Which means I went to Google Translate, and it means you can now research your French ancestors like never before. I will tell you that this is a great site. They have been doing research over there that we don't see much of unless you mm -hmm. go to Genianet. And it's going to be kept very much the same as it's been, except now Ancestry is going to be pouring in, of course, resources that they didn't have before. So this is a great thing for all of us with French ancestors. Well, in local news here in Massachusetts, North Andover Middle School students were inspired to clear the name of a lady who was accused of witchcraft in 1693. Wow. Elizabeth Johnson Jr. Yep. was never executed, Fish, but the students wanted to see her name cleared. And that inspired Massachusetts State Senator Deanna DiZoglio to introduce legislation to actually clear Johnson's name from the records. This is really good. Uh, you know, I love, first of all, that teachers are getting the kids involved to learn about history and learn about processes of government. And for mm -hmm. a state senator to jump in and give them that experience, uh, undoubtedly she's going to invite them down to the state house in Boston and oh, show how that. all this process works. This is a really great thing. So congratulations to everybody involved. And what a great thing for Elizabeth Johnson, too, to have her situation revisited after all this time. Well, you know, finding history is an amazing thing. And I think as genealogists, we're always excited when we find something that is a discovery in our own family tree. But how about when you find thousands of pages of documents in a building in the Eastern Shore House in Maryland, which is about to be demolished, and they're all about enslaved individuals from the 1600s fish to the 1800s, found in this attic in this house. And, and the amazing thing about it is, as the building was about to go down, they were going to throw all these documents out. They were going to be <sighs> gone, tossed, and now they're going to be preserved, and they cover a ton of names of enslaved individuals. And if you think about how many documents were probably lost during the Civil War, 
that's a true gold mine. Yep. I hope that some people find their ancestors in these records. But they're now being preserved and kept locally. They weren't ever sold piecemeal on the auction block, which I think was the fear. Yes. You know, you never think about how old your grocery store trip is until you read news like this. This is a story I saw on archaeology.org where 76,000-year-old bones were recovered at a large Neanderthal hunting camp in central Spain. Well, what this suggests, Fish, is that the Neanderthals both processed large cattle and deer at a rock shelter, but then they took all of that to another location to eat. <laughs> it's kind of like getting takeout, too, I suppose. Right? Maybe it's the yeah. earliest takeout restaurant, Fresh Kill on the Rocks. <laughs> Absolutely. That's crazy. That's great. That's it a great is, story. It is. The next story has me all a Twitter graves in England. Now, I love going to old cemeteries. As you know, I wrote that book on Massachusetts cemeteries. But 19,000 churchyards in England are going to be digitally mapped. The Church of England is launching a free website later next year that will list eventually every grave memorial and churchyard in the country. Now, I hope that includes memorials inside the church, too, because those are sometimes very valuable to have. Yes. And with stained glass windows. But yeah, these ancient churches, probably covering from the time of the Norman Conquest all the way down to probably people that were buried this past year. And that's great. If you think of 19,000 cemeteries and churchyards, right? how many millions of individuals that's going to include? Well, if you figure there's a thousand in each one, is that a lot? Is that mm, normal? That's... I don't know. But that, that could be 19 million right there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even if it's a fraction of that, uh, you know, five, six million. Yeah. My grandpa's from England. I'm always happy when they find another relative for me. Even Absolutely. If they have to dig it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all I have from Beantown this week. But I do want to let you know that if you're not a member of American Ancestors, you can save $20 with the coupon code extreme on AmericanAncestors.org talk to you in a little bit. All right, David. Thanks. Yeah, you'll be back for Ask Us Anything. And coming up next in three minutes, your DNA guide, Diane Southard, is going to be joining us talking about endogamy and mitochondrial DNA. What do these things mean? What can you do with it? She'll explain. Coming up next on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Unknown Parentage, Lineage Society Membership, Building Your Family Tree, Leaving a Legacy. Regardless of your reasons for hiring a professional researcher, Legacy Tree Genealogists can help you discover your family's past. Their genealogists are highly rated in their field with specialties in DNA analysis, historical context, and forensic genealogy. For nearly 20 years, Legacy Tree Genealogists have created thousands of professionally bound and digital reports for families families like yours around the world. So whether you've hit a brick wall in your research or are just getting started, Legacy Tree Genealogists can help you tell your story and preserve it for generations to come. To receive a free estimate for professional research, visit LegacyTree.com or call 1-800-818-1476. That's 1-800-818-1476. 1476. We'd be happy to talk to you. Legacy Tree Genealogists. Anytime is a great time to learn more about your family. Did you miss Roots Tech Connect this year? It's not too late to experience Roots Tech classes, keynotes, and how-to content. Just visit RootsTech.org to see what you missed and to experience Roots Tech Connect on your own timetable. Select inspiring and insightful messages that will help you in your pursuit to connect with and share your family story in new ways. You can then use the free resources found at Family Services search.org or the family search family tree app to have a deeper personal experience getting to know your family past and present connecting with family and learning about your ancestors provides healing peace and a sense of belonging and it's easy to share what you learn with others to help and inspire them as well Visit RootsTech.org for some inspiration or visit FamilySearch.org to continue on your journey of family discovery today. 
Hey, Genies. As we've dug into our family history explorations over the past year, our community at Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies has taken off. This is where you can meet like-minded genealogists who can help you break through those brick walls and find a whole city behind it occupied by ancestors whose names you don't even know yet. This is where you can learn from your fellow Genies and ask questions because many in our community have already been into some of the records you're looking for. Genealogy and Breakthrough Strategies is free. What a great place for brainstorming and getting to know other people who totally get your passion for family history research. If you're looking to take the next step in sharpening your skills, here's a great chance to learn from others and give back in areas you've already become expert in. So join us. That page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. It's a long name, but we cover a lot of territory. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. We are back at it on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, along with my guest, my good friend, your DNA guy, Diane Southard. And uh, Diane, it's been a while. It's great to have you back. Thanks so much for having me, Scott. It's always so good to talk to you. You know, I was looking at all the things that we could talk about today because you are the DNA guide. And I was thinking about some areas that not a lot of us have delved into because really there's a limited group of people, I would say, that have to deal with things like endogamy and breaking through a brick wall using mitochondrial DNA. So I thought maybe we could touch on both of those things while you're on the show today. Absolutely. And in fact, the more I've been looking into endogamy, I'm getting ready to launch a course on it. Sweet. There's actually a lot more people fighting endogamy than I thought. So really? So I think it might be more common, yeah, than we give it credit for. Well, to start it out, for people who aren't familiar with it, talk about what endogamy is. Right. So the first thing you have to do is understand the difference between endogamy and what I'm just calling multiple relationships. So if you have your grandparents were first cousins, they married each other, that's just multiple relationships. So you're going to have multiple relationships to people in that family. Okay. That's one thing. That's totally separate than endogamy, which is the process of people marrying within the same culture or family generation after generation after generation. Mm, yes. So it's really about how many times it's happened. <laughs> is there a number with that? No, not officially, but it's kind of like if it's just been kind of one or two times in the last few generations, I would consider that multiple relationships. If this is a pattern that's been going on in your family for several generations, then it's going to be an endogamy. Sure. And it's really kind of treated a little differently, isn't it? Because the closer relationships, it's easier to break down. But you start going back like in the hills of Kentucky or perhaps in Jewish communities around the world, a lot of intermarriage going on for long periods of time. Absolutely. And you kind of hit the nail on the head, right? If it happened recently, you can kind of deal with it. You can figure it out. You can see how the DNA is reflecting those relationships. But when it's endogamy, the DNA just gets really complicated. It's yeah. really mixed up. We rely so much on the amount of DNA that's shared between two people to help us determine our relationships. Right. So like if you and I share, say, 75 centimorgans, then we can estimate that you and I are third cousins. Sure. Great. So then we can, you know, start to do genealogy and figure out how we're related to each other. The problem is if you and I share 75 centimorgans and we're both from an endogamous community, that changes everything. We don't <laughs> have to be third cousins, right? We could be seventh cousins like 27 times or something, you know, Right. and it would still amount to that shared amount of DNA. So there's two problems. One is just the amount of DNA you share with someone doesn't necessarily reflect your relationship. Right. So we have to deal with that. The second problem is most of the time, if you want to be successful in genetic genealogy, you need to be able to gather a group of people from your match list that are related to the ancestor you want to research, right? You've got yeah, like of course. a huge list, right? You got to find the people in the list that pertain to your question. That's it. So if you don't have endogamy, that process of finding those little genetic groups is straightforward. Very Theoretically, much so. you, yes. you follow a methodology, right? You find the group and you're off and running. But with endogamy, it's just a lot harder to find a group of people that are related to a specific line you want to research. Yeah, it can really magnify those centimorgans. So you think you're related closer than you really are, or you're just related in so many different ways. That's what it amounts to, right? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So perfect example, my grandmother, whose mother was born in Italy, she had a fantastic DNA match on my heritage. And I was really excited. This person was from Italy and we started corresponding back and forth. And I just got so excited and kind of wrapped up in the story of it that I stopped being a good genetic genealogist. I know, embarrassing, right? I do this for a living. <laughs> but when it's your own stuff, you just kind of get carried away. We started exchanging pictures and I was like, oh, this is so fun. And they didn't really have very much family history, right? They knew their parents and, you know, like a lot of people sure, take yeah. a DNA test, they just didn't have a deep pedigree. And I was like, oh, well, let's get back to your like great or maybe two times great grandparents and I think we can find our common ancestor so I set them off on this search and they were so receptive they were fantastic and they're like great okay we'll do this and they start doing the research and putting together the tree and as they began to build it like there was no connection and I was like <laughs> no and then of course it all came like crashing back to me that my grandma yes she's from Italy but she's from this little tiny town in very northern Italy and there's about five families in that town who married each other over and over and over again. And sure enough, there was lots of signs of endogamy in this relationship oh. between this DNA match and my grandma. And I hadn't even considered it, honestly, because I was just thinking, we're not Jewish. We're not in the hills of Kentucky. Like you said, I didn't even think that there would be endogamy in this town in Italy. But of course there is because it was very small yep. and remote and Sure enough, once I clued into that, I could see evidence of it in their DNA match as well. Boy, and that, that changes the game, doesn't it? I'm sure a lot of people Absolutely. run into that. They're not expecting it, and suddenly, now what do we do? And trying right. to break that down, because really, what is your relationship to that person? You do share this many centimorgans of DNA, but your relationship isn't third cousin or second cousin. It's many different things all added up. Absolutely. Yes. Like I said, it's really complicated. But I think one takeaway tip for your listeners, if you do have endogamy or you suspect you have it, the way you can tell is really honestly by doing genealogy, just like I said. So I thought this person was my grandma's second cousin. We got back to those great grandparents. There weren't any that were the same. So if you get back to that generation where you think you connect and you don't, there's something wrong, right? So either you've miscalculated, you've done family history incorrectly. So what you need to do is go into your DNA match and look and see. So you can only see in my heritage or 23andMe or family tree DNA. You need a chromosome browser to be able to see it. And anybody who follows me knows that I do not advocate chromosome browsers. I'm never like, you have to have this. But in this situation for endogamy, it's essential because you need to be able to go in and look at the pieces of DNA that you share with your match. And then you only count those pieces that are higher than 20 centimorgans, ah. or if you're feeling very generous, higher than 15. But that's it. You don't count any of the others because the other segments are most likely there because of that shared population and not because of a recent common ancestor. Wow. So with this match from my grandma, she was sharing like 170 or something like that centimorgans <laughs> with this match, right? Yeah. I went in and counted. Guess how many were over 15? Uh, 35. 35. 35 centimorgans. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're probably fourth cousins of some kind. And so we have to just do more genealogy to find <laughs> that connection. But yeah, oh, out of boy. 170, 35 centimorgans were over my amount that I drew my little line in. So right. yeah. So that's number one. You'll just have a much better estimate of your relationship then. All right. Let's switch over to mitochondrial now. And for people who aren't familiar with that, explain how that works. Right. So mitochondrial DNA traces only a direct maternal line. So the great thing about mitochondrial DNA is everybody has it. Okay. So you can test your own mitochondrial DNA to trace your mother's, 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 mother's line. So you'll have the same mitochondrial DNA as all of your siblings, but only the females pass it on to the next generation. Right. So it's often just associated with women, but it's important to remember that men have mitochondrial DNA. They just don't pass it on. Okay. But the problem with mitochondrial as opposed to its male opposite, generally speaking, the Y DNA, is that it doesn't really follow a name line, does it? Because the women's names change every generation. Yeah, that definitely makes the genealogy more complicated. And so in, in a short explanation then, Diane, how do people use mitochondrial DNA to break through a brick wall down a female line? The best way to do it, in all honesty, is to use it in combination with your autosomal DNA test. So, for example, when we tested my mom at 23andMe, 
So at 23andMe, they also test a portion of your mitochondrial DNA so you can see what they call your haplogroup, which is just a deep ancestral group. So yep. at 23andMe, you can see your mitochondrial DNA haplogroup, and you can see the haplogroup of your matches. So my mom takes the test. She's adopted. And so we see this match who is sharing enough DNA with her to be a second cousin. And very importantly, this match is also sharing her mitochondrial DNA. Ah. So now instead of just like wondering how is my mom related to this person, it could be on any of her lines. Now we can hypothesize at least that this match is related on her direct maternal line and on the match's direct maternal line. Oh. So it really helped us focus our research on just this one line in his family tree which then connected into my mom's direct maternal line. So sometimes that combination of autosomal DNA and mitochondrial DNA can really give you that extra little hint that you need to help you decide how you're related to someone else. Great tip. What other ways can you use that? Well, so a lot of times there's some sort of history that you have, say, a Native American or African ancestor. And you take an autosomal DNA test and you don't get that percentage that you're looking for. It doesn't say you're, you know, 10% Native American or something. But oftentimes it's because this ancestor is a little bit too far back. If this is your three times great grandmother, you just may not have received enough of her Native American DNA to have it show up on these autosomal DNA tests. So what you can do is kind of double check it by tracing her direct maternal line down. So if this is your three times great, you need to find one of her daughters, 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 and so on to take a DNA test. The mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, those deep ancestral groups, yep. are very specific for Native American. And would it show up for any other group? African Americans, African, Jewish? Jewish, mm -hmm. they all have very distinct haplogroups. Now, if you wanna know if she's Welsh or Italian, that's probably not gonna work for you <laughs> because they, they don't have specific enough groups, okay. usually. I think we've been well taught today. That's your DNA guide, Diane Souther. Diane, thanks so much for coming on. Those are great tips. We look forward to hearing about some more of your workshops coming up. Great, thanks so much for having me, Scott. It's always a pleasure. Check her out at yourdnaguide.com. And coming up next, Maureen Taylor talking about metadata and photographs. What is happening to get this standardized? You'll hear more about it coming up next in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. You know, it's been way too long since we last talked photos on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, and my pleasure and joy always to talk to my friend, the photo detective Maureen Taylor out of Rhode Island. And Maureen, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. So you're part of this new group, this metadata working group, Family History Metadata Working Group, working with uh, Chris and Nancy Desmond and many others. Fill us in, first of all, on what's going on with that, because when last we left our heroes, we were seeing standardization as the target for metadata and photographs, meaning that you can actually take the information about the photo and have it travel with the picture. Right. So... All the major image formats, JPEG, TIFF, that Apple format, HEIF, PNG, RAW, et cetera, allow you to add metadata, to embed it in the image. The problem is many sites ignore that metadata. Some take it out and some override it. So while you're thinking, I've done all this work on my family history photos and I'm going to embed all this metadata, then I'm going to upload it to this site and I'm going to upload it to that site and I'm going to share it this way. And all that information that I spent all that time doing is still going to be there. The problem is it isn't. Yeah. It mostly isn't. And that's kind of been the way it's been since the start of the digital era, really, right? Pretty much. So is there progress being made in this area to try to get this standardization going between all these companies? And how does this work? So the Family History Metadata Working Group, of which I'm now a part of the group, we meet every other week 
And we have a list of companies that we're, I don't want to say targeting in a negative way, <laughs> but sort of educating about what we're trying to do mm -hmm. and why it's important and how we can come up with a set of standards so that when you put your images up various places, you'll still be able to access that information. You'll be able yeah. to read it, write it, edit it, and export it, which doesn't always happen. So let's take, for an example, Google Photos. A lot of people use Google Photos. Yes. You've added information to the digital file on your computer, such as, so metadata is things like the caption, the location, the dates, the names of the people. You upload that picture to Google Photos, and guess what? You can't read what you've embedded, which means you can't share it either. Wow. <laughs> Same is true for the major parties of Ancestry.com, Family Search, and MyHeritage. Wow. You can add images, but support for embedded metadata is very limited. And so we're in conversations with all these major companies to talk about, well, can't we come to some consensus? And the progress, as you mentioned, there has been some progress, which is last year we met and came up with a list of standards, sort of fields that we'd like to see sure. be transportable from one site to another. And now we're trying to get sites to add that code to what they do. So is there resistance to the idea of moving metadata with the photos? It's just, I think, not a major priority. The bigger sites have other things on their agenda. So if you do something else, you can't do this as well? You know, that part, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to cast dispersions on all these big sites because they're all great and we use them. But from a photo perspective and as the photo detective, I would really, really love to see these standards across all the platforms. I think all of us would. I mean, let's face it, yeah. if, we're, if we're going I mean, to the trouble, for instance, of going through and, and colorizing, say, on MyHeritage or cleaning up a picture and, and then you're adding all this detail and you throw it up there and now you've lost all the context, that's a major right, so loss. Exactly. It's huge. And I've experienced it firsthand. I've embedded all this data in a collection and then found out that I couldn't look at all the data. So I had to do it again or again and again, depending on what platform I was using. So right now, if you embed metadata in an image in Adobe Lightroom, you can view it and read it and do all this stuff with it. You can do the same thing with Memory Web. You can do the same thing with Vivapix. Sure. And I believe forever. I know that Permanent is working on the standards as well. And these are all really great companies, really forward-thinking people, having yeah. interacted with all of them over the years. But we really need one big win, don't we? We need one big one, win. One need, big one. We need this information to be portable, mm -hmm. to be transferable, yeah. so that when we upload it, imagine what the future could be. You put your images on one site, then you want to put them on another site, then you want to put them in another site, and you want to share all these things in these different platforms with various family members. Imagine that it's seamless, that everything can be read and shared, and you don't have to do it over and over again. Right. And, and the searchability of it, too, by year, the by subject. Of it. I mean, all of these things, I mean, it kind of blows my mind because it makes me think to some extent... It's going to be to some big company's advantage to say, hey, we want to be the ones that are on this because everybody's going to use that place, this big site, as their photo landing place because of this right. feature. Exactly. So the metadata that we're focused on are things like events, yep. location, album, caption, people, objects, dates. It's the basic things that I work on with people to identify their family photographs. Now, I will say that what have we learned recently? We have learned that genealogists can be very vocal about the issues relating to their family history legacy. Sure. So what can you do to help us with this mission that we're on? There are a few things. One, you can write to your favorite app or site or program, look on their websites, ask them about their metadata standards, ask them about the portability of what you've added to your images. If you have an image and you've added all that information into it, when you upload it to their site, are you actually going to be able to see that metadata that's already embedded in the image? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be able to share that? Are you going to be able to edit it? Simple question, hard answers. Right, right. And I would imagine because they've got to involve all their tech people into putting something together to make this work, that might be the pain point for the companies to actually go forward with this. But you would think, like we talked about, you get one big one, the others all have to kind of follow, don't you think? You need a champion. Yeah, we need a champion. Then there's some competition. Yeah. 
But once who's going to go first? <laughs> that's exactly right. So is this uh, an organization that others can join to support you in this work? Well, right now it's the Family History Metadata Working Group. It's a small group of us that meet. Mm -hmm. But certainly we're asking people to participate. They can certainly watch a video that Luther Takanovich and Chris Desmond did at Roots Tech last year on the Family History Metadata Working Group, and it'll explain how they can help and mm -hmm. how they can get involved. And they can join us on Facebook or LinkedIn. Oh, that's great. You know, if you're looking for a cause in family history, this would be a good one because, like you say, the repetition of having to add this every place you post a picture is a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Absolute nightmare. How powerful are genealogists? I want to tell you something that someone told me a long time ago. So early on when I started working with family photographs, it was really hard to get our good quality archival acid and lignin-free materials for a reasonable price to work on your family photograph. Sure. But as the genealogical community became more interested in preserving the objects and photographs and documents that are in their family collections, they put pressure on the companies by asking for all of this stuff. And now today you can buy those materials. And this was an industry leader who told me that without the genealogists, it never would have happened. Really? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we are a large group. I, I think there's an awful lot of potential here, and it's worth coming around to periodically to check back in and see how things are going, because uh, when that day comes that you get that one champion, I think that's a game changer because everybody else ultimately has to fall into place. Yeah. So once again, if people want to get in touch with the Family History Metadata Working Group, where do they go? They can join us on Facebook or LinkedIn. We have a website called fhmwg.org. Awesome. She's Maureen Taylor. She's the photo detective. Maureen, thanks so much, and uh, keep us up to speed on what's happening. We really need this change to happen, Scott. Thank you so much for having me on Extreme Genes. You betcha. And coming up next, David Allen Lambert returns for another round of Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, Genies, it's Fisher here, and my shiny new ExtremeGenes.com website has been described as having that new car smell. I love hearing that. Having been with you for over eight years now, it felt like time to help out listeners and followers who need to know the basics of genealogical research, as well as how to understand your DNA test results and to be able to put them to work for you breaking down brick walls, identifying birth parents, locating new cousins who may have photos and information that can't be found anywhere else, and verifying your paper trails. Yes, DNA can do all that, and I can show you how. Check out the all-new ExtremeGenes.com website and download the free Genealogy Strategy Roadmap and the free DNA Starter Guide. Then, if you like what you see, you can take those next steps to sign up for the video courses that you can watch at your leisure. I'll take you through all the basics, step by step. Find out more now at ExtremeGenes.com. Unknown Parentage, Lineage Society Membership, Building Your Family Tree, Leaving a Legacy. Regardless of your reasons for hiring a professional researcher, Legacy Tree Genealogists can help you discover your family's past. Their genealogists are highly rated in their field with specialties in DNA analysis, historical context, and forensic genealogy. For nearly 20 years, Legacy Tree Genealogists have created thousands of professionally bound and digital reports for families like yours around the world. So whether you've hit a brick wall in your research or are just getting started, Legacy Legacy Tree Genealogists can help you tell your story and preserve it for generations to come. To receive a free estimate for professional research, visit LegacyTree.com or call 1-800-818-1476. That's 1-800-818-1476. We'd be happy to talk to you. Legacy Tree Genealogists. Genies. Ancestry.com has just released an important new database, and it's free. It's the Freedmen's Bureau Bank Records and the Freedmen's Bureau Marriage Records. These records are a game changer for African American research. For the first time, searches for ancestors among these records can be done solely within these two databases, making discovery easier than ever before. Every name in these mostly post Civil War records has been indexed. We're talking three and a half million names, and they 
often include the names of parents, siblings, children, former slaveholders. They commonly provide ages, marriage information, and so much more. In some cases, you can read in their own words some of their stories as well as their post-emancipation ambitions and challenges. If you've been hesitant to seek out your African-American ancestors because of the pre-1870 research challenges, now is the time to see what information is waiting for you right now for free. Only at Ancestry.com. All right, we are back for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. And David Allen Lambert is back from the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. And David, our chief genealogist, here is our first question. It's from Lance in Wellesley, Massachusetts, actually your neck of the woods. And he writes, Fish and Dave, I have a War of 1812 ancestor. And I'd like to know where he may have served and what battles he may have been in. Any tips? Boy, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about here. Well, I mean, the first thing, obviously, you determine that the person was a veteran. So that's great. So you're going to have that whole hierarchy of who is the captain, who is the colonel. And from there, you should be able to find out the regiment. Always my biggest tip in military is adopt the regiment because there may be papers and letters from the captain to the colonel that may speak to more detail about where they are and maybe a diary. The other thing about adopting a regiment fish is that you want to see if anybody else's descendants from that same company may have had papers or letters or something that may describe it because we don't have the narratives from the War of 1812 like we do in the Civil War. That's Civil true. War, we have regimental histories. Yeah. War of 1812, not so much. I'll tell you, the War of 1812 is really tough. My wife has a fourth grade grandfather who came over from England and wound up in the War of 1812 in the 17th Infantry Unit, which was originally set up in Kentucky. He was in Ohio. They wound mm-hmm. up on the invasions of Canada and the Battle of Lundy's Lane. And then they withdrew from that battle. And a few days later, they were down at Fort Erie, right across from Buffalo. And mm-hmm. the ancestor got his arm blown off. And so we had to have his arm amputated. I mean, it was quite a story. And the reason we know about it is because if you go to Fold 3, they have his pension application there. Right. And this account of how he lost his arm was written out by his company commander, his company captain. And so that guy happens to have a lot of information out there about him. So we found out when he joined that particular unit. And we Mm -hmm. also were able to find out through Ancestry when the ancestor enlisted. So we have the date of when he enlisted, the date when he lost his arm and effectively was out of commission forevermore as far as military service went. And Mm -hmm. then when this particular commander came into play, well, by following his record, because he was an officer, there's a lot more stuff about him. We can follow where his company went. And that's how I Mm -hmm. learned that he was in the Battle of Lundy's Lane, which was the bloodiest battle of the War of 1812. Well, you know, it was just a year ago that I found out that my third great grandfather, who somebody put on Ancestry, he wasn't a very tall man. And I'm like, wasn't a tall man? How would they know how tall he was? Well, he was five foot four. He was an artificer for the U.S. Light Artillery and was at the Battle of Plattsburgh, which was the last battle of invasion in New York until September 11, 2001, when we were attacked. So one thing I want to tell Lance and anybody else out there, if you're a guy and you want to join the General Society of the War of 1812, join Massachusetts, even if your ancestor didn't serve there. Or even if you don't live here, we have an offer, life membership for $125. Oh, nice. So, yeah. One last thought on this whole thing. Create a timeline, not only for your person, but also for the officers he served under. And then research that officer, as David mentioned, because you can often find out more about what they did, because there's usually a lot written about the officers, but not necessarily the enlisted men. And the other thing is look up the soldiers that your ancestor served with. Look and see if they had a pension. Maybe your ancestor didn't get a pension, didn't live long enough. And the other thing, go to Family Search on their wiki for the United States in the War of 1812, and you'll find all sorts of amazing links. 
Isn't that great? So there's a ton of stuff out there, Lance, so go get it, and good luck. The War of 1812 is kind of an odd one because most of us don't know a heck of a lot about it. So thanks for the question, Lance, and we've got another one coming up when we return for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Let's do it again. Another question on Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here with David Allen Lambert. And uh, Dave, this question comes from Valerie in Cincinnati, Ohio. And she says, guys, my great aunt passed away in Minnesota. And when we cleaned out her place, we learned that she had saved probably every postcard and greeting card she had wow. ever received, including the envelopes. I don't want to throw wow. them all away. What should I do with them? Oh, that's a well, great, I'm glad great question. Well, I'm glad you didn't throw them away because that's a timeline. A yep. timeline of both your ancestor, where they're living because they're addressed to your ancestor. Yes. Because you have that address. And it's also a travel journal. Maybe it's a niece or an aunt or a grandparent that's writing from a trip. You've got the postmarks on them. And if those greeting cards have most of the envelopes... You get addresses again, more postmarks. I mean, it's a treasure trove. That's a really a big deal, yeah. A lot of people don't think of the value. Like, I have a lot of postcards from the 50s and the 60s that my grandmother had that they were going to just toss out. And I said, no, 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 we need to save these. So why? I said, because show me where there's a travel diary. And every time that my grandmother and grandfather went on a trip, they wrote on the back of it where they were. And they just bought the postcard. They didn't even mail them fish. Yeah. So they just have them as sort of like a souvenir. Ah, <laughs> oh, here we go. Here's a penny postcard. Boom. This is where we were. But I can retrace and remap their travels. So, I mean, you can think of a million ways probably to do this, but do an Excel spreadsheet. You have one column that could be the date, a row that might be the name. You could start tracking who has a postcard from a certain year, where they're living, open up different tabs. So many different ways to do this. This is an amazing collection and a great winter project if you're not in a sunny state. Yeah, absolutely. And you know the thing that's really fun about this, too? There could be some family news that somebody's responding to or sharing in these cards as well. Hopefully, you've got some letters in there as well that might be able to give you some further information on that. My mother was a, I won't say she was a hoarder because she wasn't anything close to that, but she saved all the things related to family. And we have mm -hmm. letters home from World War II and, and postcards from my grandmother. Famously within our family, my, my grandmother used to send to my mother obituaries of people she'd grown up with because my mother was now in Connecticut and she'd grown up in Oregon and and my grandmother would write isn't it nice to keep track of your old friends <laughs> with the obituaries <laughs> well, you know postcards are a thing of the past really now. yeah I mean I went to Disney World this past week and when I was at the Disney store at the airport I saw three that's it Disney World postcards different styles I mean they used to have them of every character and all the rides the only way you're going to find those now is on eBay. That's true. So, yeah, because everything's done digitally. Yeah. But think about it. How many times when someone sends you a picture of where they are, do you actually go to the bother of printing them out? And we're losing so much current history because people don't do it the way our parents and grandparents did or even when we did them years ago. Well, and I would suggest, too, that if you really don't have space for something like that, scan them, mm -hmm. digitize right. them, That's save true. them that way. And then you might be able to actually, you know, create a little book or something that they're in that will be part of the story of your great aunt or closer relatives to you as well. So that is a great question. Thank you so much, Valerie, and good luck with that project. <laughs> it's going to be interesting what you find in there. And of exactly. course, if you have a question for Ask Us Anything, you can always email us at the strangest location. Ask us anything at extremegenes.com. David, thanks so much. Great to talk to you again, bud. 
Talk to you soon, my friend. Yep, next week. And thanks so much to Diane Southard for coming on the show, talking about endogamy and mitochondrial DNA. And Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, talking about metadata in photos and how they're working to get companies to actually take that metadata with the pictures when you upload them. Hey, if you missed any of it, want to catch it again? It's easy to do. Just catch the podcast on Apple Media, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and TuneIn Radio, and of course, Extreme Genes.com. We'll talk to you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 